Lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. At the name of Jesus, every knee must bend, every tongue proclaim. Say it with me. Proclaim it, live it, make it the meaning of your life. Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm Father Al Lauer. Glad to share the Word of God with you. We were talking about principles of biblical interpretation. And we said it would make a difference whether you're a Jehovah Witness or not, whether you're a renewed Aryan or, uh, or dug up from the dead Aryan, which is basically what a uh, Jehovah Witness is, among other things, or whether you believe in miracles, whether you receive healing, whether you receive Holy Communion and really receive the body and blood of Christ or think you're just receiving a symbol. There's a big difference between receiving a memory and the real Jesus, body and blood, soul and divinity. And so it's very important to interpret the Bible properly or we will deprive ourselves greatly and be, as it says in Matthew 22 and 29, greatly and badly misled. And so we're talking about principles of biblical interpretation. Our first session, we got into several principles and then just mentioned a few in passing. And in this session, we'll try to get into those principles that we did not have time to treat properly in the earlier program. So let's pray right now. Father, we pray in the name of your wonderful son, Jesus. And we pray that your word would be received. And we know, Lord, that your word is life, not our interpretation of your word, unless it's the true interpretation, but only your word and only your true interpretation is life. Mary, please pray for us. Satan, we stop you. Jesus, may everyone who hears this word give their lives to you. Amen. I'd like to quote a few things here uh, just to get us started. What's proper biblical interpretation? Pope John Paul II, when he's talking about scholars who spend their whole life trying to work on the interpretation of the Bible, says, um, while engaged in the very work of interpretation, one must remain in the presence of God as much as possible. Hmm. Wow. Pope Pius XII, Divino Afflante, period two, we mentioned that in our previous teaching. He says, the true meaning of the scripture is the one that leads to, excuse me, this is, this is Pope John Paul II quoting from Pope Pius XII. The true meaning of the scripture is the one that leads to, or quoting based on Pope Pius XII, a personal relationship with God. How do you know you get the right, relation, right interpretation of Scripture? If it leads to a personal relationship with God, you're doing all right. Uh, this is another one. Um, Bonaventure said, He who understands Jesus Christ understands the Scripture. So it's very important for us to understand the Scripture properly. If we understand it wrongly, that's probably not an indication of our mental inabilities, but because we are not right with God. Hmm. And, and then it's kind of the other way around, too. Uh, they kind of, it's kind of catch-22. It goes both directions. If we don't know God, we don't understand the Scriptures. If we don't know the Scriptures, we don't understand God. And Wow, it's a, it's a very serious problem. So we were talking about principles of biblical interpretation. We gave five resources, authoritative resources. Uh, and basically, the, the Bible itself tells you how to interpret it, at least to a degree. 
but the the in, the resources we gave you was Pope Leo the Thirteenth over a hundred years ago in 1893 wrote it, the encyclical entitled in Latin Providentissimus Deus, where he talked about uh, understanding the proper interpretation of the Bible. Then Pope Pius XII in 1943, Divino Afflante Spiritu, as the Latin title. And then uh, Vatican II on Divine Revelation is the English title. And then um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church has some extensive teaching on proper biblical interpretation. And then the interpretation of the Bible in the Church, which is a document it came forth from the Pontifical Biblical Commission. And so we have those five sources. And some of the things that I said in the previous session and in this one are based upon these sources. So Pope Leo XIII, Pius X, Vatican II, and Catechism, and the Pontifical Biblical Commission, the interpretation of Scripture in the Church. Our first principle, we said the Bible is the Word of God. Our second principle, the intent of the author is the basic meaning. The intent of the human author is the basic meaning of the text. Our third principle, you must understand any part of the Bible in the light of the whole Bible. You must do full gospel teaching. And then our fourth principle, you assume that the meaning is literal. And then the fifth principle, the New Testament fulfills the Old but it does not abolish the old except when it specifically says it does. And we, we said, for example, Matthew 5, Jesus said, they used to say eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Well, I say, offer no resistance to injury. Well, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, in one way it's not totally abolished because it's a principle of justice, but it is abolished in some ways because Jesus says we're not going by that anymore. We're going by offer no resistance to injury. So, um, so you get the idea. Now, for example, I am a priest, but not a priest insofar as everyone who is baptized is a priest. I'm a priest in an in a, a extra way. Uh, now, where did that come from? Now, some people say, well, there's no such thing as a priest like you. You just made that up. Because that got, we got rid of that in the New Testament. No, there's a fulfillment of priesthood, but is there the abolishing of a particular group of people who are priests in a unique way? If there is, you have to see it in the text, or at least in the traditions of the church. There is no abolishing of this. There is a fulfillment of it. There is no abolishing of it. So a special a group of people who are priests in a special way still is in effect. Or to say, well, in the Old Testament, uh, the major focus of worship was sacrifice. But that's all over with now because we had the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus and that's all over with now. Has that been abolished? That's what people would say. Is it specifically say it's abolished? Now some people looking at Hebrews 10 would say it says there's a once and for all sacrifice so it is abolished. It's over now. No more sacrifices. Well, that doesn't seem to work very well. For example, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I, offer, I beg you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. You say, well, they don't really mean sacrifice. That's just kind of poetic. But... Uh, <laughs> They, they seem to use the word sacrifice on other occasions and also sacrificial um, terminology. I think they mention that in Romans 15, also Hebrews 13. Uh, and say, well, maybe there still are sacrifices, but they're not sacrificed like they used to be. Okay, we understand that, yes. It's fulfilled, but it's not abolished. Does that mean the... Uh, well that, the so then there's, there is... Uh, sacrifices continuing. You say, well, not really because there's a once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. Well, then maybe that is continuing. Maybe that is not just a historical event, but an event that transcends history because it is God working who is beyond time. Uh, anyway, you, you kind of get the idea. It seems to be indicated by the words, do this in memory of me. When Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, do this in memory of me. If you understand memory according to the way Jewish people understood memory, according to the original language, and also according to the context, memory it doesn't just mean a nostalgic thing, but it means to um, continue in the presence of, to make present again something. Well, anyway, you can see where biblical interpretation 
comes into play here with the whole idea of sacrifice, Eucharist, priesthood, and, and so many other things. But the, the idea is, what is the relationship between the Old and the New Testament? I'm going to read from um, the Vatican II document on um, divine revelation. And um, and let's see, in the Old Testament, this is section um, section 16 in the Vatican II document. God, the inspirer and author of both testaments, wisely arranged that the New Testament be hidden in the Old and the old be manifest in the new. So the old's got the new in it, the new's got the old in it. The old's hiding the new, and the new's manifesting the old. For though Christ established the new covenant in his blood, still the books of the Old Testament, with all their parts caught up into the proclamation of the gospel, acquire and show forth their full meaning in the New Testament, and in turn shed light on it and explain it. So the Old Testament is manifested in the New, but it sheds light on the New and explains the New, and of course the New certainly explains the Old. Um, in section 17, or excuse me, section 18 of this document from Vatican II, it is common knowledge that among all the scriptures, even those of the New Testament, the Gospels have a special preeminence. So within the New, there's something special about the Gospels and the New themsel themselves, uh, the New Testament itself has a certain preeminence. Um, so what is the relationship between the Old and the New? And that Matthew 5, 17 about not abolishing the law but fulfilling it. It's very important to get that, get that straight. There are many... This is a principle of biblical interpretation that um, is very critical. We, like we said earlier, one principle is the full gospel. You've got to see every verse in light of all the other verses. But how do you see the light when it's Old and New Testament? That's a very uh, critical interpretation principle. Okay, the next principle, this is number six. Remember the first one? Bible's the Word of God. Second one, the intent of the but human author is the basic meaning. Third one, we must understand the Bible in the light of the whole Bible, the full gospel. Fourth one, the literal meaning is the assumed meaning. The burden of proof is on someone who says it's not literal. And then uh, fifth one, the New Testament fulfills the old but does not abolish the old except when it specifically says it does or the church in its tradition specifically says it does. And then number six, the magisterium of the church, meaning the official teaching office of the church, is the final word. What's the magisterium? The pope. What's the magisterium? All the popes of all times. What's the magisterium? The bishops united of all times. Not just one bishop, but the bishops united. Uh, what's the magisterium? Councils, ecumenical councils. Uh, what's the magisterium? Encyclicals, other official teachings of the church. That's the magisterium of the church. Those, that's the teaching office of the church. And um, this, the magisterium is the final word on the interpretation. You can see why we need a final word because even though at first interpretation sounds very simple, you say, well, you just have to look at the, the text and the context and know the original language and know the, um, the culture and um, know the whole Bible and then see, get the proper relationship between the old and the new. Boy, when you get that last one, know the whole Bible, get the proper interpretation of the, of the old and new. You can see how you can make some mistakes. So the, the church that was used by God to create the Bible, to preach the Bible orally, to teach the Bible orally, to write the Bible down, to select which books of the Bible are truly the Bible, the church that was used for the creation, formation of the Bible is the, the church that has the authority on saying what the Bible means. Without the church, you would never even have a Bible. And without 
the um, tradition of the church. You would not have the Bible. A lot of people say, I go by the Bible. I don't go by traditions. Guess what the Bible is? It's a bunch of traditions. <laughs> you get the idea? You got to have the church and its traditions or you wouldn't even have the Bible. You would have no way to know what books are in the Bible. If somebody came up to you and said, uh, these books are in the Bible, not the books you got. The Koran's in the Bible. And say, well, how, the Koran can't be in the Bible. Say, the Book of Mormon's in the Bible. Say, well, how could the Book of Mormon be in the Bible? Because I said so. And say, well, you're wrong. Say, well, why do you say you're wrong? He says, well, because I said so. Or other people said so. But, you, you know, nobody, somebody's got to have authority. Somebody's got to have authority that is, that is not, that is outside the Bible, or we wouldn't even know what books are in the Bible. This is just logical. The Bible cannot stand on its own because we wouldn't even know what's in the Bible if we were relying on the Bible. It's just logical. Uh, so if someone said the book of Koran, the book of Mormon is in the Bible, what could you say? You can't, you can't say the Bible doesn't say that. You can't say the Bible says uh, which books are in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say which books are in the Bible. You have to have somebody say that before you even got the Bible. You need the church, or you don't even have a Bible, or you don't even know what's in the Bible. So, um, so you need the church, but you don't just need the church to tell you what's in the Bible. You need the church to tell you what the Bible means. And it's not just whoever happens to be part of the church. You need someone officially. You need not just someone, but you need over the centuries an official teaching body. You need the magisterium. Uh, let me explain this in several ways. First Timothy 3.15, it says, The church is the pillar and the bulwark of truth. Without the church, you will be trapped in, in uh, just having differences of opinion that uh, even with various principles of biblical interpretation will never be resolved. But the church is the pillar and the bulwark of truth. 1 Timothy 3.15, 2 Peter 3, 1 and 20. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. It says that, first of all, you must understand there is no prophecy contained in Scripture, which is a personal interpretation. Now, that can be translated different ways, but this is uh, probably as good a way or maybe the best way of all. You can't just decide on it yourself. You need somebody beyond yourself. Prophecy has never been put forward by man's willing it. It's rather men impelled by the Holy Spirit that have spoken under God's influence. Now, of course, everybody says, I'm impelled by the Holy Spirit speaking under God's influence. Somebody else says the opposite, and they say they're filled with the Holy Spirit too. Well, how are we going to settle this issue? Well, we, we need an official teaching body, the magisterium of the church. Well, let me read a few things here. Maybe first of all, we'll start with Pope Leo the 13th, uh, one of the, uh, one of our first source that we listed in teaching about um, the uh, proper interpretation of Scripture. This is from um, page 21 in the St. Paul edition of Pope Leo the 13th encyclical on the study of sacred Scripture in Latin, Providentissimus Deus. It says, the maintenance in the strongest possible way of Scripture's full authority. Now, you can get some authority from the Scripture without having the magisterium. And, of course, our Protestant brothers and sisters have certainly understood that. But you can't maintain it in the strongest possible way, and you can't maintain the full authority of the Scriptures. It cannot be done completely or satisfactorily except by means of the living and proper magisterium of the church. Vatican II and section 10, it says on Revelation, this teaching office is not above the word of God, but serves the word of God, teaching only what has been handed on, listening to it devoutly, guarding it scrupulously, and explaining it faithfully by divine commission and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, the vegetarian just can't make up what the Bible says. It's serving the Bible. It is not above the Word of God. It is serving the Word of God. Teaching only what's been handed on, listening to it devoutly, guarding it scrupulously, and explaining it faithfully by divine commission and with the help 
of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to um, Vatican II and section 12. And um, it says, For all of what has been said about the way of interpreting Scripture is subject finally to the judgment of the church, which carries out the divine commission and ministry of guarding and interpreting the word of God. All right, let's go to the catechism. This is section 108 in the catechism. Still the Christian faith is not... Oh, let me see. I'm going to read another passage here. This is 95. I'll probably get to 108 later. 95, it says, um, It is clear, therefore, that in the supremely wise arrangement of God, this is the Catechism 95, but it's also in Vatican II on divine revelation. It is clear, therefore, that in the supremely wise arrangement of God's sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium of the church are so connected and associated that one of them cannot stand without the other. You don't even have the Bible without the church, but you don't have any official statement from the church without the magisterium. But you don't have the magisterium without the, without the church, and the magisterium is to serve the Bible. So you see, they're like a tripod unless you have all three of them, None of them is going to stand. So 95, this is quoting from, in the Catechism, but it's quoting from uh, Vatican II on divine revelation. It's clear, therefore, that in the supremely wise arrangement of God's sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium of the church are so connected and associated that one of them cannot stand without the others. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Now our seventh principle, as we said, there's many more principles, but we just... Uh, do the best we can here. Um, our, our seventh principle is all the meanings that are, are in accord with the original ten of the author, but not only with the original ten of the author, but with the intent of the author seen in the light of the whole scripture. Now we already said that, but also in the light of the teaching of the church. So um, there are things that are not in the Bible that God's revealed to us. And, there, and of course, it's the same God speaking. Not only does every part of the Bible have to fit in with every other part of the Bible, it has to fit in with anything else God has revealed to us through the tradition of the church that is authoritative but has not been made part of the Bible. But... Um, so not only are the traditions of the church that have been written in the Bible authoritative, but those who have, that are officially uh, taught by the church universal over the centuries. So uh, one way of putting that is called the analogy of faith. This is from Romans in chapter 12. Uh, the use of the translation is in proportion to faith, but in propor the word in the Greek is analogia, which is... Uh, most kind of almost literally translated the analogy of faith, meaning that everything would have to be in accord with all of divine revelation, not only that which is found in the Bible, but which is found in the tradition of the church. So that's kind of full gospel extended past the pages of the Bible, but not extended into personal opinion or human traditions, extended to the divine traditions, uh, some of which have been put in the Bible, but not all of which are in the Bible. Well, as we said in our first session, these are not the only things to know about interpreting the Bible, but these seven principles, I think, can be a great, great help to us. Um, I'm going to read um, a little bit more from the, the catechism here. And it talks about the various senses of Scripture and I already mentioned the literal sense. Now, in section 117, there is what is called the spiritual sense. Now, as I said, the, the literal sense, which is not always, but usually 
the intent of the author. That is, the intent of the author is the meaning of the passage, but not the only meaning of the passage. Many passages have a, what they call a sensus planior, meaning a fuller sense, a spiritual sense. And uh, the document that I referred to before, the interpretation of the scriptures in the church, have, have said in that document that in more recent times there has been a, um, I guess you'd say, a developing understanding of the spiritual sense of the scripture, that we're understanding that more now. And so here in section 117 of the Catechism, they list three uh, ways of looking at the spiritual sense, meaning something is over and above the intent of the author, not contrary to the intent of the author, but beyond the intent of the author. There's the allegorical sense, you know, like for example, and the ark is, a, is an allegory of being saved through baptism, or being saved, the, the chosen people being saved through the Red Sea is an allegory of baptism, or David is a type, a, a kind of a, a prefigurement of Jesus. Then there is the moral sense, St. Paul said, in section, or he said in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, these things have been written for our instruction. So there's a moral sense that's beyond the original intent of the author. Like for example, there's parts of the Bible that, uh, that are showing the importance of purity, but that's really not maybe the original intent, but it's still a spiritual meaning. And then, then there's the anagogical sense. Anagogy means to lead on. This is a, what you would say, leading, uh, to, to things of eternal significance. So like, like uh, the church uh, reaching the promised land, anagogically would be, could be going to heaven. Well, anyway, that's the best we can do in a short time. But it's very important to interpret the Bible properly, and the sources that we mentioned can help you. And I would especially encourage you to look at the catechism on this, and, and then... Um, really benefit from the word because you're not just getting an opinion or a false interpretation, but you're getting the truth of the word. Let's pray right now. So Lord, may we take your word to heart and by the power of the Holy Spirit through the church, in its tradition, in its magisterium, by its authority, know the true meaning, the true interpretation, and live it and base our lives on it. We pray all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days.